Hey everyone, Wandering Bard here, and today I'm going to talk more about Pokemon. In a previous video, I detailed my first attempt at nuzlocking my favorite Pokemon game, Pokemon Coliseum. That attempt actually made it to the very final battle of the game, but I ultimately wiped against Evice. I was only able to get through attempt 1 in that video, partly because of how long the attempt ran, but also because when writing the script, I made the assumption that most people aren't going to be familiar with how Coliseum is set up, since it is a spin-off game. If you're watching this video now, I'm assuming you've either watched the first one or you're at least familiar enough with how Colosseum works to know what's going on. If neither of the above is true, then I'd highly encourage you to watch the first video using the link in the description. For your convenience, the challenge rules are also in the video description. They haven't changed much since attempt 1, except that I'm now only allowed to use the call mechanic on Pokemon who are in hyper mode. I can't use it on sleeping Pokemon anymore. Also, just so you know, the content in this video actually starts with attempt 3 of this challenge, not attempt 2. Attempt 2 ended about 3 minutes in when I saw that my Espeon had an adamant nature. I should probably explain why this is relevant, since I didn't know how most of this worked until I started watching Pokemon content. For any individual Pokemon, there are 4 things that determine their stats at any given level. First are their base stats, which are constant for a given Pokemon species. So, any Espeon that you happen to obtain will have the same base stats as any other Espeon. Next is their nature, which is randomly selected from a list of 25. Each nature will increase the growth of one stat by 10% at the cost of decreasing growth in a different stat by 10%. So, some natures will increase and decrease the same stat and therefore have no effect. Because of Espeon's psychic typing and high base special attack, it's used as a special attacker, so any nature that buffs physical attack or nerfs special attack isn't great, and an adamant nature is truly terrible because it does both of those things. Third is their individual values, or IVs. Each individual Pokemon has an IV between 0 and 31 assigned to each of its stats, which further influences their stat growth at any given level. An IV of 31 is amazing, while an IV of 0... Not so much. I should note here though that IVs only influence how much a Pokemon's stats grow for a Pokemon of that species. So, an Espeon with a low special attack IV will still have a higher special attack stat than most Pokemon because of its high base special attack. But, for an Espeon, it won't be great. And if that low IV is paired with a bad nature, then we're really not looking great. Last is their effort values, or EVs. EVs are stat buffs obtained by Pokemon when they defeat other Pokemon in battle. Different Pokemon give different EVs when defeated, so the player has some control over what EVs their Pokemon receive. We'll talk more about EVs and IVs later. For now, just understand that my Espeon had a truly terrible nature in Attempt 2, so this video will start with Attempt 3. I chose to continue the Final Fantasy theme naming tradition from the previous video. Because the theme of this run is me going back in time to change the fate of Attempt 1, though, I named the avatar Noel, Noel Christ which means my female companion is named Sarah, which is an interesting multi-layered reference if you're familiar with Final Fantasy XIII 2. In that game, Sarah has the eyes of Etro, which let her see the timeline. In this game, she has the eyes that can see Shadow Pokemon, to which these two goons take exception and they kidnap her. So, being the gentleman that I am, I walk up to them and I'm like, You want her? Then you're gonna have to go through me! So I rescue Sarah from the mirror BPNs, but they try to capture her again, this time with backup, and Sarah uses her eyes of Etro to help us identify and catch our first Pokemon, a Makuhita. Nice. Exiting the mayor's house, we once again have a choice between the evolved Johto starter Pokemon. This time, I choose Bayleaf rather than Quillava for two reasons. For one, since so many of this game's bosses throw around powerful water and ground type moves, investing a ton of time into a Quillava seems like a waste of effort. But, more importantly, I'm hoping that Bayleaf can help me with the encounters in Pyrite Town, which were one of the most stressful parts of Attempt 1. I didn't have a proper strategy for this part of the game last time, so I just rolled into it with Pokemon who were either under level or don't have all of their moves. I didn't fully explain this in the previous video, but when you first catch a Shadow Pokemon, the only move it knows how to use is Shadow Rush. As each successive bar of its heart gauge is emptied, it regains one of its moves, then its nature, and then two more moves. In Bayleaf's case, the first move it regains is Synthesis, which is very beneficial in a run where I can't use items. The problem is, Bayleaf's only attacking move is Shadow Rush, which can trigger Hyper Mode. And if it's in Hyper Mode, it cannot use Synthesis. So here's what I do. 
First, I have Bayleaf battle some weak trainers in Fennec City and Pyrite Town who don't have Shadow Pokemon until he has Synthesis. Next, I walk up to this guy, Bandana Guy Dival, and snack his Quagsire. With that out of the way, his two water types don't pose much of a threat to my grass type Bayleaf, so I can battle him over and over until Bayleaf has all of his moves. This is also beneficial because his Pokemon both drop special attack EVs. So, if I put Espeon in front of these battles as well, I can give him a boost to his already amazing special attack stat. I battle against Dival until Bayleaf reaches the last bar of his heart gauge, where it now has both Razor Leaf and Body Slam. I do the same thing for Quagsire since there are some Shadow Pokemon that I won't want to put Bayleaf up against. I also fight Rider Leva, snack her Skip Loom, and Friendship Grind it until it learns Sleep Powder. After that, the other encounters go without much trouble, and I'm soon able to move on through the Pyrite building. As I'm doing that, my Makuhita does get doubled up on and killed by two Thrashes, but that's okay. There are plenty of fighting type Pokemon in this game. I catch Mantine, Quillfish, and Swablu just like before, and then take on Mirror B. My strategy is mostly the same as in Attempt 1, but now we've replaced Skiploom with the much tougher Bayleaf. I do end up switching Bayleaf in after Swablu gets dived on again, and they're able to deal with the Ludicolos pretty efficiently. When Sudowoodo comes out, I do risk losing Noctaw as I go for a Hypnosis, but I don't miss, and I'm also able to get a Reflect off before I switch in Quillfish. I try to catch Sudowoodo while it's still sleeping, but it wakes up and then poisons itself going for Shadow Rush on Quillfish, which, you know, not ideal since that does put me on a timer. Thankfully, Poison makes it easier to catch as well, so next turn I snag it, and that's the first I've been defeated. I go to Agate Village and nickname Espeon and Umbreon. This time, I name Espeon Hope, and I name Umbreon Caius. Don't worry, not all of my nicknames are going to be from Final Fantasy XIII. I am going to mix it up in just a bit. But first, I have to fight Scrub, and here we run into a problem. Because I've been EV training Hope in Special Attack, I'm now worried that a Psy Beam will one-shot Hitmontop even through his high special defense. So I try to wear it down with Return, which doesn't do nearly as much as I thought it would. Then a Shadow Rush leaves Skiploom with 7 HP as he misses Sleep Powder. So I now have to choose between killing the Hitmontop with Psy Beam or letting Skiploom die. I decide that Hitmontop is the more valuable encounter, so next turn Skiploom goes down. Noctowl comes in, thankfully doesn't miss Hypnosis, and I'm able to catch the Hitmontop. Sleep Strats also allow me to deal with the Why Not just like before. Now I'm able to purify and nickname my Pokemon. I keep my nicknames the same where possible, but there are some new faces in this run, and some Pokemon are different genders now. Bayleaf evolves into a Meganium, and I name him Zac Fair. Mantine is now Tidus, Ampharos is Rama, and Swablu is Cloud. We start grinding up to fight Dakim, but as we're doing that, this guy with two Geodudes decides to have one of them use self-destruct while I wasn't looking, which immediately killed Hope. It also killed his Sand Slash, so Caius was the only survivor on that battlefield. Now I have to bury my beloved Espeon AGAIN. I can't easily carry on through the Nuzlocke without him, but I really hate to go through the whole rest of the run without my favorite Pokemon. So, since we're still relatively early in this attempt, I do choose to reset here. This is objectively a terrible decision and not how I advise anyone to play their runs, but I'm stubborn and I'm stupid and I want to see if I can keep my Espeon alive through a whole run if possible. What happens next is a whole bunch of resets, most of which were due to bad IVs or bad natures on one or both of my starter Pokemon. I get a little pedantic about this because the starters do carry a lot of the early game, and because it only takes a few minutes to reset at this stage. In attempt 6, my Espeon has amazing IVs in most of its stats, but its HP and defense are both on the low side. So while fighting Dival and his Quagsire, it manages to one-shot Espeon with a critical hit Shadow Rush. All sentimentality aside, resetting here is much more justified, since Espeon is literally one of the only Pokemon I can level up right now. This all happens in one evening of streaming by the way, so I'm really not having a good day. So while I do end up recording a beginning to what ended up being attempt 10 of the run, albeit with a pretty terrible Bayleaf this time around, I ended up getting into a really bad headspace and needed to take a break for a few days. So I took a few days off and played Chrono Trigger, and then when I came back to the run, I decided to start fresh. In Attempt 11, my Espeon has a bashful nature, which is neutral, in a near-perfect special attack IV. My Bayleaf in this run still isn't great, but at this point I kind of have to live with that. I managed to catch Quagsire without losing anybody this time, but somehow this Quagsire ends up being even worse, as it has not one, not two, but three median IV values of one, those being for its special attack and both of its defenses. Quagsire's base special stats aren't that great to begin with, so this is a problem. Its base physical defense is better, 
but this one has a lonely nature. Plus attack, minus defense. So this Quagsire is terrible on both of its defenses. Additionally, it has Damp as its ability instead of Water Absorb. Damp is a fine ability. It stops self-destruct moves, which given how Espeon died in attempt 3, that's pretty appealing. But not having Water Absorb is a pain, especially since Quagsire again has terrible special defense. Just look at what happens during the battle with Firma. Mantine outspeeds because Quagsire's base speed is also terrible and puts him in crit range with a single bubble beam. That means that setting up my special defense was a waste of effort since critical hits ignore defense buffs. Admittedly, I had kind of botched things in the fight with Wreath right before this, so my team wasn't in the best shape and I lost my Fly Affy against Firma. I managed to catch the Mantine, who ironically also doesn't have Water Absorb, but I'm really concerned about my lineup here. This Quagsire being as terrible as it is constitutes a huge problem since it's the only Earthquake setup I have that isn't 4 times weak to Ice, besides Pilot Swine who's just bad anyway. With Nazca's Wall Rain waiting for me in the finale, and with me needing to use Altaria if possible for the finale as well to deal with Evice's Caesar, I choose to reset here in hopes of rolling a better Quagsire. At the very least, I know I can play the Wreath and Firma battles better. Then I get three special attack nerfing natures in a row on Espeon, including another Adam in nature. Like, seriously, what's up with this? I know there's a fair few natures that can be considered suboptimal here, but it seems like I only get objectively bad natures or neutral ones. Where's modest nature Espeon when I need it? But on attempt 15, I strike gold. My Espeon here is basically a repeat of attempt 6. Neutral nature, poor IVs and HP and defense, but pretty solid in everything else. But my Umbreon has a bold nature, plus defense, minus attack. Since dark type moves are special in Gen 3, Umbreon doesn't need good physical attack, so a bold nature means he'll be an absolute tank in both defenses at basically no cost. We get through the early game as usual by catching Bayleaf and Quagsire. This Bayleaf actually has surprisingly good stats this time around, except for a pretty poor physical defense due to a low IV combined with a lonely nature. This does cause some issues with getting our early encounters, because Pokemon like Mischievous and Furid can outspeed and put Bayleaf in crit range with just one attack. So we can't use Synthesis as reliably, but we end up going unpunished. Our Quagsire still has Damp as an ability, and still has pretty bad special defense, but its defense and special attack are both much better this time around, so I'll live with it. It just means I need to play certain battles more carefully. This time I lead Espeon and Umbreon against Wreath and Firma, since I remember that they counterpick Wreath's front two pretty effectively. I also go ahead and just kill the Remoraid to minimize the damage I take before fighting Firma. Against Firma, Umbreon is able to snatch Agilities away from her Apom as I swap Espeon for Bayleaf, since Espeon's Confusion isn't doing much damage to the special defense tank that is Mantine. Bayleaf Razor Leaf isn't doing much either, so I go for a Body Slam, which crits Mantine and paralyzes it as Umbreon goes for a strong bite on Apom. So next turn I snag Mantine, kill Apom with another bite, and then it's smooth sailing from there. We get our cave encounters without too much incident, grind for a bit, and then take on Mirror B. This time I just lead with Bayleaf and Noctowl, since Swablu has an unfortunate habit of getting dived on in this fight, and we don't have too much trouble. Against Scrub, I'm cognizant of the fact that my Espeon is more frail than usual, so I lead with Quagsire and Skiploom, which pays off a Scrub leads with his Geodude rather than Why Not. Unfortunately, Hitmontop outspeeds all of my Pokemon, and a Shadow Rush leaves Skiploom with 4 HP. Skiploom does put it to sleep and Quagsire kills Geodude with a Surf, while on the next turn Mega Drain doesn't do nearly as much damage as I thought it would to his Clamp Pearl, so Skiploom goes down to a Waterfall. Thankfully, Hitmontop wakes up on the fourth turn of sleep, so we have plenty of time to get Noctowl and Bayleaf in, but Clamp Pearl still being difficult and also puts Noctowl in kill range as we put Hitmontop to sleep, so we swap her for Hope. But then we kill Clamp Pearl, so Why Not comes in, and we have no sleep setups to use on it here. We stall a bit until we catch Hitmontop and then go for a Helping Hand boosted Body Slam, since this Why Not is just spamming Mirror Coat. But then it does use Counter, which leaves Bayleaf with 1 HP. So we saw some more with Synthesis and then try to figure out what to do. As I'm researching mid-fight, I realize that Caius is actually immune to Mirror Coat, which would be great if we could swap him in. But I also learned that Counter only sees the last physical move it was hit by when calculating damage. So, if I have Espeon go for a return, and Bayleaf goes for a Body Slam, Counter will only see Body Slam, and countering a non-Helping Hand boosted Body Slam should never result in a kill on Bayleaf. So we go for it, and why not just use his Mirror Code anyway, so we're all good. After this, it's time to once again get through Dakim's Grunt Trainers. This time I lead with Zach Fair and my damp Quagsire, who is now male, so as suggested from chat I name him Gladiolus every battle, 
so there's no risk of anything randomly blowing up. As I'm doing this though, I notice that Zack Sparrow's special defense really isn't growing as well as I'd hoped. We need an intervention here, and it turns out we have the perfect item to help with this, the Macho Brace. The Macho Brace is any EV trainer's dream item. It halves the speed of the Pokemon holding it, but doubles the EVs they gain in battle. By giving this item to Zack and battling against Bandana Guy Dival over and over, I can dramatically increase his growth in special attack. I also briefly give it to Hope to give him a little more special attack before the Dakin fight, and then go to Fennec Coliseum, win some lovely TMs such as Rain Dance and Giga Drain, and then a little more grinding before I take on Dakin. I lead the Dakin fight with Zack Fair the Meganium and Titus the Mantine. Dakim leads with his Golem and his Metang, which gives Titus a free turn to set up Brand Dance as Zack Fair knocks out the Golem with a Giga Drain. Giga Drain also kills his Marsh Tom on the next turn and heals the baby amount of damage that Metang is doing with Psychic, as Titus Bubble Beam does a significant chunk to the Metang in the rain. Next up is Camerupt, which Titus kills with Bubble Beam, but sadly, Giga Drain leaves Metang in the red as Entei comes out. So we switch Zack for Gladiolus as Titus finishes off Metang, and then the two water types make pretty quick work of Entei. After that, our resources significantly open up, including access to the Under and its TM shop. So it's time for another game of what hidden power type does everybody have? But as I'm doing this, I make the stupidest misclick in my gaming life. As I'm grinding up for the battle with Venus, I stop by the power I call CM to use their heal station. But my tired, distracted brain autopiloted to the Coliseum desk and entered the Coliseum challenge, which I would never do in my right mind since the Pokemon there range from level 51 to 55. Mine, as you may recall, are level 40. Let's not mince words here, my entire team wipes here. This loss really knocked the wind out of me. For once I actually had a really strong attempt on my hand, was playing well, and then in one misclick I lost it all. This is admittedly part and parcel of doing these types of runs, but I was feeling super mentally deflated at this point. Afterward, my good friend Taffy VA, who you should totally subscribe to if you haven't done so already, had an intervention with me and encouraged me to take another hiatus. I did start the challenge again and eventually did win, but this video is getting kind of long as is, so that'll be detailed in a separate video. I hope you still enjoyed this one, and that you'll consider liking and subscribing to see how the Nuzlocke finally ends. But for now, this is once again the best I can show you. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.